Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming and joining us for the third and final panel discussion of the day. For those of you just joining us for the first time, my name is Mo Alethi, and I'm executive director of the Institute of Politics and Public Service here at Georgetown, and couldn't be more thrilled to be uh, helping to organize this Clinton 25 symposium. So far, we've heard panel discussions on the 92 campaign on Bill Clinton's vision of America, his vision for the world. But if you spend any time on this campus, you know how important the Jesuit ideal of service is and being men and women for others. And so this final panel is going to look at that a little bit. I was a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service in October of 1991 when then Governor Bill Clinton came to Georgetown to deliver his new covenant, uh, his series of new covenant speeches as part of his presidential campaign. And it inspired me. Georgetown was an electric place during that campaign. Even those college Republicans that didn't vote for Governor Clinton still thought it was pretty cool to have a Hoya at the top of a national ticket. And so before we get into the meat of today's, uh, this conversation, one, I think an incredibly important one, we thought we would give you all just a little glimpse into life at Georgetown during the 1992 campaign. In the 1990s, Georgetown was such a vibrant place to be because of all of the uncertainty and this new world order that everyone was talking about. The Cold War had just come to an end. In 1989, the wall fell, and the international system seemed to be undergoing a fundamental change. The economy was really hurting, and the job prospects for students, for instance, was, hey, you know, would there be jobs for us when we, when we graduated? My freshman year at Georgetown was in the middle of the Gulf War. I remember half of my classmates and I all registered for the selective service. And in the midst of this comes this very, very young politician, a man out of Arkansas, but most importantly, a son of Georgetown. Bill Clinton's candidacy kind of started off, I think, as a cool thing, but eventually ended up electrifying this campus. In the fall of 1991, I was the managing editor of the Hoya, and we got word that uh, a governor from a state, I don't know, maybe Mississippi or something, was gonna come uh, and give a speech. And it turns out that it was not the governor of Mississippi, it was the governor of Arkansas, and his name was Bill Clinton. We simply have to go beyond the competing ideas of the old political establishment. And I sat there in that first New Covenant speech that he delivered in Gaston Hall, and I was amazed. I believe that the only way we can hold this country together and move boldly into the future is to do it together with a new covenant. There was a generational disconnect, and I think there was a real hunger for some sort of change. That didn't get picked up by a lot of the professional political class, but I think that Bill Clinton picked up on that. Governor Clinton at the time had an energy a hope that things could be better. The Georgetown students for Bill Clinton had t-shirts and on the back they said, Princeton had Wilson, Harvard had JFK and FDR, but Clinton came from Georgetown. And that was uh, really how we felt. Because he was a son of Georgetown, because he was educated in the School of Foreign Service, Georgetown owned it. The idea that, uh, you know, Hoya could actually be elected president was pretty exciting, and I got a lot of students really, like myself, really interested in it. Regardless of where they were on the ideological spectrum, and I think you saw a lot more involvement in the 1992 campaign as a result of that. Good evening. Governor Bill Clinton hopes for a big win as the polls are clogged with voters. I'm Gina Curry. I'm Andy Pearson, and welcome to the beginning of our coverage of the 92 vote. Election night, 1992, obviously one of the most important nights in my life. It really did kind of change my life. There were two competing election night watch parties that night. College Republicans was a very proper affair, whereas the College Democrats uh, watch party was just around the corner in what was then the, the campus pub. 
all of us were watching the election returns. At this moment, 40 percent to 43 percent. There's always a degree of anxiousness um, on election night. It was kind of getting a little close, and then we saw him sort of break away with some states. And when they finally called it, the place just erupted. Together we can make the country that we love, everything it was meant to be. I still believe in a place called hope. God bless America. Thank you all. The energy, the excitement, tears of joy, people jumping up and down, and we knew that a Hoya would be in the Oval Office. That youth, that energy, that optimism is what inspired so many of us. Bill Clinton made politics real for me. I think it reinvigorated our students to continue to pursue careers in public service. Georgetown has always had a sense of mission that an education here could lead to an opportunity to, to make a difference. So I think in some ways, all of those steps I took professionally and have taken, I trace back to being absolutely fascinated with this guy from Hope, Arkansas, who came to Gaston Hall to give that first New Covenant speech. feel like it was just yesterday. Uh, for those of you that have been here for the other panels, I apologize. I have to do some housekeeping again. Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as the speakers, it's expected that everyone in attendance at this event respect the right of the speakers and the organizing group to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. At the conclusion of the event, there will be a question and answer session during which you may ask questions and engage in dialogue. Please be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. And in the interest of time, we ask that each person be concise and ask only one question. And we ask that only uh, students uh, participate in the, in the Q&A. Um, so as we said, it, Bill Clinton really spoke to me as a student and I think really helped inspire people and had a very real sense of what national service meant. And if you've been to any of the other panels today, you've heard that theme uh, tied in over and over, the sense of service. And so for this final panel discussion, we thought we'd bring in some people that know a little bit about his style of leadership and his approach to service, not just for himself and, and the White House and the government, but also how he tried to inspire all Americans to national service in whatever form that took. So to introduce our panelists, uh, I'd like to invite up Catherine Lyons, a second year student at the McCord School of Public Policy, who is uh, from California, from Sacramento. Catherine, come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Clinton 25 Summit and for our panel today, Vision on Leadership and Public Service. My name is Katherine Lyons, and I am a second year Master of Public Policy student here at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy. I got involved in the Institute of, for, for Politics and Public Service my first semester here, and over the past year, I've had the opportunity to work with and learn from practitioner, practitioners, journalists, and policymakers. I also serve on the advisory council of the Baker Center for Leadership and Governance, a center within the Institute of Politics and Public Service, and a co-host for this event. As a future policymaker, the experiences with both GU Politics and the Baker Center have been invaluable in cultivating my leadership skills and teaching me what's required to lead successfully in the public eye. So today, we will hear from, about the vision of leadership and public service from an esteemed group of panelists who were leaders in the Clinton White House. John Podesta served as White House Chief of Staff to President Clinton from 1998 to 2001, uh, where he helped to carry out the final policy agenda items of the administration. He is the former chair of the Washington, D.C.-based think tank, Center for American Progress. In 2008, he served as co-chair of President Obama's transition team. He also served as counselor to President Obama. His duties there over included overseeing climate change and energy policy. Most recently, he was chair of Hillary for America. Erskine Bowles first joined the Clinton administration as head of this small business administration. In 1993, he was brought to the White House to serve as President Clinton's deputy chief of staff and later as chief of staff. 
In that role, he served as a member of the President's Cabinet, the National Security Council, and the National Economic Council. Working with Congress at the direction of the President, Bowles negotiated the first balanced budget in a generation. In 2010, President Obama asked Bowles to co-chair with former Senator Alan Simpson, the, Na uh, the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. This bipartisan commission produced a plan to reduce the nation's deficit by $4 trillion over the next decade. The plan was supported by a supermajority of the commission and with bipartisan support. Mac McLarty has been close friends with former President Clinton since kindergarten and served as President Clinton's White House Chief of Staff from 1993 to 1994. While in that role, he helped enact a historic deficit reduction package, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the Family and Medical Leave Law, and the landmark welfare reform legislation that enabled more than 6.8 million people to move from welfare to work. As counselor to President Clinton, he advised him on a host of international and domestic issues. He is currently chairman of the McLarty Companies, a fourth generation transportation business. And finally, Judy, Judy Fader will be our moderator for this discussion. Dr. Fader is the uh, uh, faculty advisor to the Baker Center. She is also a professor and was the former dean of the McCourt School of Public Policy. She is a renowned health policy expert conducting research for Brookings and currently for the Urban Institute. She served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services in former President Clinton's first term. So today, usually we tell you to turn your phones off, but today's a little different. We'll be encouraging you to engage on social media with the hashtag Clinton25 and tag at GU Politics on all channels. So without further ado, please help me welcome our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you and with all of you this afternoon. Um, I think there are many in the room who've been here all day. We had two fabulous panels, um, inspiring, I would say. And when Mo set this one up, he said that we were supposed to tie a bow on it all. <laughs> right? And so we're going to tie that bow because we're asked to talk about the um, president's vision of leadership and public service. And that clearly applied in the operation of domestic policy, the operation of foreign policy, and throughout the, uh, throughout the administration and beyond. So, and we know that it didn't, that the president's uh, commitment to pub leadership and public service didn't start with the White House. And so I thought, Mac, we would start with you. Uh, we know that before Bill Clinton entered the White House, he'd been governor of Arkansas. He was a leader among the nation's governors, and he took that, all that experience with him when he entered the White House from Arkansas, not Mississippi. You yeah. want to be clear about that, yeah. right? Th thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> You're very welcome. So you were with him clearly from the beginning. I, I don't know what he ran for in kindergarten, but I'm sure there was something. So what can you tell us about the goals and expectations that President Clinton brought to his new job? What was he trying to achieve and how did he do it? Well, Judy, first of all, it's great to see you again and to be with John and, and Erskine and to be on the Georgetown campus at this 25-year reunion. Our older son, Mark, is a Hoya, 19, class of 1995, so it feels like a real homecoming in that regard as, as well. Judy, I think it is fair to say, not that all roads lead to hope, although I would like to say that since I grew up there, <laughs> but I really believe that the beginning of President Clinton's feeling for, understanding of, belief in public service really did begin there at a very early age. When his mother, uh, of course his father had been killed tragically in an automobile accident before he was born, his mother was attending nursing school, Virginia, who was a wonderful influence in his life, and he spent many hours in his grandfather's store, which really had as its clientele um, lower income people who were working hard uh, to make ends meet, and he saw that firsthand, and he saw his grandparents uh, feeling to them, trying to help them. And I think that influenced his very feelings about public service and how he related to other people. I mean, he was a president who could feel your pain, had that wonderful empathy, connectivity that served him so well politically, but also as a leader. Now, obviously, from that time, he got a, a great education, I think, in the Hot Springs Public School where he moved to. 
He still talks about his teachers and mentors there. Came to Georgetown, clearly the Jesuit training, clearly his time here was formative, critically important. And then on to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar in Yale, and as you noted, uh, as governor of Arkansas for over a decade, and kind of the rest is history, uh, as they say. But I think that really shaped his views, his values uh, about public service, about relating to people uh, in such a personal way. And then he worked hard to broaden that. And I do think his, his tenure as governor really gave him an insight into governing and getting things done. So that's my, that's my perspective on it. That's good. And let me just follow up a little bit because he, you're, we brought him to the White House with that perspective. Yep. Uh, when he came to the, the White House, Washington is not Little Rock. He had to build the government. He had to develop his agenda and proceed. How, how did he approach that, putting his administration and his government together? Well, you're right. Washington is not Little Rock. On the other hand, he had obviously... Uh, In so many time, ways. Uh, <laughs> for both good and bad, but we will not dwell on that. Um, <laughs> but, but he had worked here for Senator J. William Fulbright. I think that helped shape his views of the world. Obviously, his time here at Georgetown, as I've already noted. But, Judy, I think you make the right point, and John certainly remembers, as does Erskine. He was following, uh, <clears throat> the Republicans had held the White House for 12 years. So that was a big change in terms of not only getting a government in place, but a change in direction for the co country. He also, as you so showed on that clip, only got 43% of the vote with a third party candidate getting 19%. So that was a factor. We were able to get our cabinet in place uh, all confirmed save one the day after the inaugural. So I think the president really worked so in such an engaged way with his cabinet. I think that was a great strength. Richard Neustadt, the historian, talks about the cabinet loyalty. But I think, Judy, he, he had, as he outlined in his speeches here, and we'll hear more about that, I'm sure, later today, he had a vision of what he wanted to do as president. He put that vision forward. It was under kind of the themes of putting people first, which go back to my earlier comments. It was under the themes of opportunity, but responsibility and a sense of community, an engagement in the world, as Secretary Albright talked about. But to do that, you had to be strong at home, which meant balancing the budget, which that first economic plan in 93 helped put in place, and Erskine was able to do. And as a baby boomer, I don't know that we really thought the budget the federal budget could be balanced. I think we thought we could slow the growth of it, but balancing it until we got momentum in the economy and so forth and some other good breaks along the way, I'm not sure we thought we could accomplish that. But Judy, I think without vision, without a plan, is just kind of folly. Governor Clinton as a candidate and President Clinton had a plan to put in place, specific policies to get things done and to work with the legislature to get it done, to govern. And that's really what I think were the hallmarks of his eight years as president. He was the first Democratic president reelected since Franklin Roosevelt. Good. And you've, and you've turned us to thinking about putting people first in the economy. And one of the, the early things he did was raise taxes um, and move on. To well, you had that. to mention that. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm rich people. <laughs> Only on rich people. But Judy, let, me, let me just make one quick comment. Make but obviously, let, let John and Erskine get, you know, get, they, they get their comments made because they'll, they'll obviously have so much to add here. But, you know, the truth is, and John, you'll remember it well, before our first cabinet meeting at the governor's mansion in Little Rock, uh, the deficit, frankly, was considerably larger. And Erskine, you're the investment banker here and understand this very well than Governor Clinton had understood in the campaign. So that really altered some of his campaign discussions, but he did it in a responsible and I think a courageous way, and it worked out pretty well for those 22 million jobs and the rising of incomes. Indeed, and in response to earlier questions, I was in the room when Gene Sperling had to tell him he was wrong, <laughs> right? So it was, it, 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 mm. but he rose to the occasion. And Erskine, thinking about that balancing the budget, uh, that was on, on your watch. You were very much involved in getting that through. It was the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. 
It was very much a move across the aisle uh, and um, is an interesting story all by itself. And we'd love to hear from your perspective what approach to leadership did that entail and how how to get that done? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was, it, this is amazing. Uh, Judy called me and she told me the question she was going to ask me. And Come on, Erskine. Which, I've, I, I'm making it up right which, now. which I thought was great because I told her I couldn't remember things that happened 25 minutes ago, <laughs> much less 25 years ago. So I said, I'm going to make some notes so I can at least uh, uh, draw up something. Uh, I think Mac was right before we turned to the budget. Uh, for me, working with these two guys and with Madeline and the team that's here, uh, it was a highlight of my life. I mean, I was a young guy from North Carolina who never had any in dream at all to be involved in, you know, the world of Washington. And President Clinton gave me that chance for public service. And what I loved about President Clinton is I always knew where his true north was. I knew what he stood for. I knew what he believed in. I knew what he would fight for. And, you know, he always told us he would fight for this or that until the last dog died. And I know Mac knew what he believed, what he was talking about, but I don't think Podesta did. <laughs> <laughs> you learn quick, though. Yeah. And, and he would only compromise where that compromise wouldn't impinge upon his priorities. And, you know, uh, those priorities were easy to see. I remember when I went to the SBA, I came to see Mac and I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he handed me uh, uh, this little blue book said, putting people first. And he said, Erskine, read this and you'll know exactly what he wants you to do. And I did because that was his Bible. That's what he believed in. And when I took the job in the White House, uh, I got to see it firsthand. I can't count the number of days that he would come over from the East Wing long after we'd already gotten there to go to work. And he'd have all of these clips torn out from various newspapers <laughs> and got from everywhere. And he'd write a little note on some of them and say, Erskine, go fix this. <laughs> and and what, I, what I loved, it would be some young person from Kansas or Nebraska uh, who had a problem. And that person would never know that the president of our country cared enough about them to worry and want to fix their problem. And that's what he did. I always felt that was why he loved the uh, AmeriCorps program so much, which, you know, you two played such a big right, part yeah. in. But, you know, if, if you think about the AmeriCorps, he used to say, say the AmeriCorps program was a twofer, is at least how he described it to me. Number one, these low and moderate income kids can get the resources they need to get a college education and then they'll be able to compete and win in a knowledge-based global economy. But he said what's doubly good is after they graduate, they get to do two years of public service, two years of community <laughs> service, and they'll be able to pay that debt back, but they'll also find the love he had for public service for the rest of their lives because he felt public service was contagious. And I know there been probably a, a million kids who've gone through that program who now want to continue to do public service every year of their life, just like he did. Now, the budget... Uh, we can... I just... John, you want to chime in on any of that on the North Star? I'm just thinking that, that you were, you've been nodding and thinking about it from your own perspective before we go to the budget? Well, you know, I think that uh, it was what centered... The administration. Mm -hmm. He knew who he was fighting for. He got there every day. He knew the people he wanted to help. And through thick and thin, uh, hmm. when times were good and times were bad, all he cared about was could he deliver for the people who needed the government to be on their side. And uh, in some ways it made... Uh, I, I, Max said something that, that 
it was important, vision without a plan. You needed a plan. Uh, in my case, I remember, and the other people who are here, Maria, I think is still here. Um, he'd freshen that plan every year in the State of the Union. And people used to make fun of him because he talked too long, and they'd, you know, the press would go, oh, my God, how long is it going to be this year? <laughs> it's like 55 minutes last year. Can he top that? Um, but he thought that was both the operating manual for the administration, and it was a bunch of promises that he was making to the American people, and it was his chance to talk unfiltered to the public. No snark, no media interference, whether it was you know, at the beginning when he was probably talking to 60 million or at the end when he was talking to 30 million. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he could tell them what he thought the state of the country was, what the state of the world was, why he was proposing the things he was proposing and what he was going to do to get them done. That was the plan. And then it was our job exactly. to go execute that. And I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but I think that, again, even in, in, in some very difficult days, um, he, there was never any question when he, Erskine made a reference that people don't get, when he said, long after the rest of us got into the office. <laughs> <laughs> We would start, I don't know, 6.30, 7 yeah, o'clock. <laughs> He'd saunter in, Mary, what, about 9.30 yeah. or 10? Yeah. <laughs> he liked to stay up late uh, and sleep in a little bit in the morning. Yeah. But when he got in there, he knew exactly what he wanted to do and who he was trying to uh, uh, take care of and demanded uh, that his staff, that was what they needed to pay attention to. Great. And so now, and, and one of the achievements, and it was mentioned this morning, it's a good yep. one to talk about, is the balancing of the budget. So, Earth, can you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, John is right. He was the first adult hamster I ever met in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he would call me at, you know, like 2.30 in the morning and say, what are you doing? I said, I'm sleeping. just calling you. I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> And, you know, a good thing I, I learned is, you know, if I would just let him talk, he would never know I was sleeping while he was sleeping. <laughs> but, but as it relates to the budget, uh, <laughs> uh, which is always a really exciting subject, but the, pre the, the president was a fighter. I meant that, man. He would fight till the last dog died. And he was willing, which very few public figures I've met before or since, he was willing to do the tough things you have to do to end up with a principled compromise. As you mentioned, Judy, the Republicans shut down the government not once but twice in 1995 when President Clinton wouldn't go along with these severe cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, education, and the environment. He wouldn't do it. And when they came forward and said, we're going to block grant Medicaid, he said, over my dead body. If I lose the next election, we're not going to block grant Medicaid to the states and hurt these people. The Republicans, they thought he would cave. They thought he would give in. And when he didn't, they found out they were dealing with a guy who had a real backbone, a guy who would stand up and fight for what he believed. And I think it was that strength that he exhibited in 1995 that was the power that we had to negotiate a balanced budget in 1997. Because the Republicans understood that they were dealing with a guy who had a backbone, a guy who was tough but not unreasonable, a guy who would negotiate but never compromise his principles. And whereas people think, Judy, that he was proud of balancing the budget, he was. But that wasn't what he was proud of. What he was proud of was how he balanced the budget. 
He was proud that we were able to put our nation's fiscal house in order. But what was important to him is that while we did that, we protected our values, that we did this balanced budget in the right way. Let me give you a couple examples. In that balanced budget, the president got additional funding for a new child tax credit to help those people who needed it to raise their kids. We got the funding back for the Hope Scholarship tax credit mm -hmm. so that people could afford low income and moderate income kids could afford to go to college. We got an expansion of an earned income tax credit in a kind of unusual way by stacking it on top of the child tax credit. We got additional funding for training so people could transition from welfare to work. And we cured some of the biggest flaws in that welfare to work bill. But the thing he was most proud of was that he was able to get funding for a new entitlement, creating the children's health care insurance program, the CHIPS program, where he got health care insurance for five million poor kids. We took the kids who didn't have health care insurance from over 14.5% down to 5%. And when John and I walked in that office and told him we had a deal, he looked at me and he listened. We told him what we got. But boy, when we told him we got that health care insurance for five million poor kids, I've never seen a guy light up so much. Because that's why he ran. Mm -hmm. Those are the priorities and principles under which he governed. That was his true north. And I'm telling you, he got on that phone and called Mrs. Clinton, and I thought the roof was going to cave in. They were so happy. <laughs> it's the great, greatest day of my life. Uh -huh. It was a good time. It was. It was a good time. And as you say, it came about after some tough times with, that, with those shutdowns. Uh, and, that, and when he moved on, you were able to move on from that yeah. um, to actually work across the aisle and get that balance back. But it was only because he had shown, shown strength yeah. in those shutdowns and engaged in the fight in 1993 that they had the respect for him and knew he would stand firm. So, moving on, John, to uh, later, toward the end of the administration, there were other tough times. So you were there, it was, a, a, I, I think I, you said uh, when we talked about this, that it was probably, with the exception of the shutdowns, it was probably the time the greatest antagonism between the parties. And as we got to the end of the administration, that's a, it's a tough time in which to be able to muster some enthusiasm and get the job done. <laughs> so how, how, how do you and he do that? Yeah, well, the, the students here will kind of recognize that period towards the 98, 99, uh, when politics resembled a tong war. And uh, I think the, the, uh, the truth is that the, the uh, Republicans on Capitol Hill who had won majorities in 94 in the election as a result of the first uh, budget that, that Max steered through. Um, uh, but they won majorities in both houses of Congress, so we we're uh, operating with a very hostile Congress, uh, made more hostile by the idea that they got in their brains that they could toss them out of office. <laughs> and um, so I was there. Um, you know, the, the politics of personal destruction sort of yeah. began a little bit earlier. It was how Newt Gingrich uh, got to ascend in the leadership in the House, amongst the House Republicans. He knocked off a former uh, speaker who, who probably nobody here probably still remembers, but who was a great guy named Jim Wright. Uh, and his whole thing was uh, to make it personal, go after the president, um, use a guy named Ken Starr to try to help him in that endeavor. Um, but during all that whole period of time, coming back to what I think we've all said, so it wasn't all like it's all put on, putting all the happy talk and the roof coming or going up or coming down. We had some pretty tough times uh, and some pretty strong uh, fights uh, with those with those Republicans at that time. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, Nelson Mandela said something to 
the president wants, which the president and, and Mandela, I think, later wrote about this. Uh, they became great friends, really great, great friends. Uh, but the president tried to understand how Mandela couldn't have been filled with hate, having spent 27 years in a prison on Robben Island. And he said, and Mandela told him, if I hated them, they would still control me. Um, and the only way to be free is to let that go. Uh, and I think, oddly, the president, I mean, he wasn't happy every day. He could get uh, pretty vociferous about how he was feeling and being put upon and, and being attacked. Um, but I think he always tried to just get stuff done. And um, as we were talking about this, this, uh, this panel, I remember at the, the last meeting we had uh, with the Republican leadership um, in, in 1998, uh, in the middle, uh, Starr had sent his report up to the Hill. There was uh, campaigns were being waged on whether you'd keep them or toss them. And we picked seats up in 1998, which I think was the first time that had happened, Mo, uh, for, for when, as you're teaching the practice of this, first time it happened since 1822 when the Whig Party collapsed, <laughs> um, <laughs> that a six-year president actually picked up wow. seats in, in a midterm election. And we, uh, the Republican reaction to that was to toss Gingrich, uh, but they proceeded under Tom DeLay's leadership to uh, proceed with that. Um, and we got ourselves a new speaker. Eventually, it kind of, the ball bounced around a little bit. Bob Livingston was there for a little yeah. bit, and then uh, Denny Hastert. Uh, and uh, just finished with this story, which is uh, one of the things that the president wanted to do was the economy was roaring. People at the bottom, um, Bruce and Ron mentioned this, were doing really well. Maria talked about it, too. The uh, poor people were finally seeing their wages grow up, really even at a faster rate than the rest of the economy. Uh, we had low unemployment, uh, and things were pretty good. But there were places still left out in inner cities, in rural America, on Indian reservations. and. Uh, the president went on a trip with Denny Haster to, to Chicago with Jesse Jackson. They, you know, kind of looked at places that were pretty bombed out and said, you know, we gotta, we got to target some investment to these communities. Year goes by, election happens, the Congress, like now, couldn't get its work to, done uh, and uh, had a continuing resolution putting the budget off till December. Election happens, Gore wins the popular vote, loses the, loses the presidency on a five to four vote by the Supreme Court, and, uh, and loses the electoral college as a result. And uh, we're all in the Oval Office. And it's um, Hastert and Trent Lott and Daschle and Dick Gephardt, who was the Democratic leader in the House. And it's like, let's just get out of here. Right? I mean, everybody is like frayed. This is like the week after Bush v. Gore's decided. And we're trying to settle up uh, on the budget so Congress can go home and make the last compromises being practical. Everybody gets up out of their chair. And Clinton puts his hand on Hassard's shoulder, puts him back down. He said, Denny, remember when we went to Chicago with Jesse? And, uh, you know, you and I both agree that we need to make those investments. He said, why don't we just stick that $30 billion in this bill <laughs> <laughs> to invest in those places that have been left behind? And, that's him. And D yeah. Dashiell piped up and said, that's good with me. <laughs> and and Gilbert says, yeah, I'm fine with that. And everybody turns and looks at Trent Lott, <laughs> who no more wanted to do this. <laughs> Then, you know, uh, I don't know what. And, but he finally realized, I'm not getting out of here and getting home for Christmas <laughs> unless I say yes to $30 billion in this, what we call the New Markets Initiative, to go to poor places in this country that have been left behind. And that's what he was like. You that's know, it. every day. Talk about keeping your eye on the ball. Yeah. 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 That's a no missed that's opportunity. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's open the floor to questions. 
Go right ahead, Joe. Where's the, Joseph, where's your, the mic? It's coming? You're three for three today, Joseph. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we want at Georgetown, persistence, right? Absolutely. That's the spirit it. of Clinton. Um, so I'm Joe, you know me, I show off on the now. <laughs> How's a <our> word, yep. <laughs> um, my question is, which, which Congress do you think is harder to govern under? Newt Gingrich's contract for America under his strict leadership that was uh, tried to oppress any Clinton policies? Or the current Ryan Congress that he can't control and not even the Democrats can really control and unify their own side? So it's a disunified opposition better, easier than a unified opposition. I'll take a quick crack at it. Uh, I think uh, Erskine, you and John both dealt with the Republican Congress there. But I think you make a very good point. We had a Democratic majority when President Clinton was elected in both the House and the Senate. And then you had this dramatic change, as John and Erskine both have spoken about, with the contract for America and Newt Gingrich. I would say it cuts both ways. When you're in the majority, you don't have as natural of opportunity or dynamic to push back against to show contrast in what your approach and plans are as you do when you have a majority. So in a kind of a perverse way, uh, it helps in that sense to really draw a sharp contrast uh, and it kind of forces perhaps some bipartisanship, which I think all three of us are strong believers in. But today's dynamic uh, is, is quite, quite different. It's a different time and place. But I think it goes back, Judy, to the central theme that President Clinton, or candidate Clinton, not only had a vision, he had a plan, and he transitioned, which is the challenge of the first year, as Maria and Bruce and others remember, from the campaign to governing. And he was able to do that. So I think that goes to your question as well. Well, uh, again, I think that you, you're seeing a president with majorities in both houses of his own party mm -hmm. unable to get anything done. And I think that is partly now the structure, particularly uh, of the way uh, the Tea Party, which you know kind of rose up in the wake of of uh, President Obama's success in his first term when he was governing mm -hmm. with Democratic majorities in both houses, has taken over and created a uh, pull to the right uh, in the House of Representatives. The, the you know, thing that I think is true about what's going on with Trump as president is that he thrives in creating more cleavage <laughs> and sort of splitting his own his own party uh, on Capitol Hill. And as a result, he hasn't really gotten anything done on Capitol Hill. Now, the you know, I'm kind of glad about that because I think his principal uh, desire uh, was to take uh, health care away from 22, 23 million people. So I'm glad that he didn't succeed in that. Uh, but it is an odd way of operating to basically work, the, work uh, in the cleavage uh, of the party, and I think the net result has been that he's disempowered uh, congressional leadership, so I think they have a harder time delivering the votes uh, for even what he wants to do. We'll see uh, what happens with the, with the tax care bill, but there's also, you know, I mean, I think that is the one, cutting taxes for corporations and wealthy people is the one thing that unifies the entire kind of Republican base, so we'll see whether he's able to manage his way through that, but um, uh, I think he must be a challenge to them, but they, they clearly uh, have leadership problems now in the House. Gingrich had much more, and Gingrich and Army, mm -hmm. they, they were coming, and then, uh, and then DeLay and Hastert, which kind of followed, had, uh, they brought those, the, the more right and the more kind of center right wings together, and when they wanted to do something, they produced the votes to do it. And I, you know, the, they're they're having much more trouble uh, in this context now. I can I can give you a great example. Somebody asked me one time, "How did we balance this budget?" And I said, "Well, we had great leadership, and it does take leadership. It does take a real plan, and it takes somebody who's willing to stick to their principles." 
But one of the ways it got done is I had to spend months and months and months locked up in conference rooms with Newt Gingrich, and you owe me a lot for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the way Bill Clinton was. He, he was, you know, if he was like doggone bone. Man, he was absolutely, he was going to stay at it till we won. And my job was to stay in there and to build up trust because there's a real lack of trust in this town. That's a good point. And we tested each other over and over again to see if we would take some little give that the other side gave and go out and tell the press in order to win the day. But that wasn't our plan. Our plan was to balance the budget and balance it in a way that reflected our values. And to do that, we had to play the long game. We had to have the vision that Mac talked about. And we had to be willing to really work at it day in, day out for months. But over that period of time, we did build up enough trust. We did find a common ground. He did bring people together. And Newt was able to control his caucus. He got some things, we got some things, but we got the things that Bill Clinton believed were really important for the country. And we did it by really working at it day in, day out. Great. Another question. Yes. Back of the room there. Um, what parts of Bill Clinton's vision and plan is the Democratic Party still pursuing today? And what parts of those things has the Democratic Party discarded? Uh, I'll quickly start. It's a different time and place, number one. It's the 25th year anniversary, so you've got a very different world. You've got a totally different set of dynamics, needs, priorities, principles, concerns, problems in a world that, as all of you understand, perhaps better than any of us on this stage, in fact, you do, that's uh, changing in an accelerated manner. You can kind of feel the tectonic plates of history shifting. So it's a different time and place, number one. Uh, but I think uh, that there's some... Uh, principles or themes, uh, tenets that are very much the same. Number one, you've got to govern. That's part of the disconnect in the country. It's a dysfunctionality here in Washington. You don't see that so much at a state and local level. So that's, that's number one. Number two, the government here is to serve the people of this country. I think that's putting people first. And I just don't think you can get away from uh, fiscal responsibility. And I think finally with Secretary Albright here, I think to, to lead internationally, you've got to be engaged abroad, but to do that, you've got to be strong at home. So there's a lot of common themes, but obviously a lot of different ones, and John, you and Erskine might, might pick up on that. Very good question. Look, first of all, I don't think there's anybody left in Washington who's a true fiscal conservative who really does want to do the right things that puts our nation's fiscal house in order, who's willing to make the compromises you have to make to do that, to produce the kind of revenue you need, to make the kind of cuts in spending that you have to make in order to have enough to invest in things like education, infrastructure, and research so America can compete and win in a knowledge-based global economy. I don't see any of that. Secondly, there are not many globalists left in this town that understand the importance of our position within the world and our responsibility for leadership within the world. So I think it's a very different uh, environment that we have here. And lastly, I'd say we don't have a leader today that's trying to bring people together to find common sense solutions to the really big issues and big problems that we face in the country today. And I think without that leadership, it's awfully hard to get anything positive done. I have, I have a little bit of a different take. I, you know, I think central to Clinton's economic theory was uh, the success of the middle class, mm -hmm. that uh, attacking uh, income inequality and attacking the, um, uh, the growth that was uh, being driven in a way that was really unequal. And I think the heart of the Democratic Party still believes in that. Yeah. I think that, that uh, investing in trying to see wages growing and in terms of equal pay for women, in terms of trying to provide uh, people with the supports they need to raise strong families. I think the heart of the Democratic Party is still right dead center in saying our success is modeled on whether uh, working people and people in the middle are succeeding, not, with, not necessarily what the overall growth rate is. In order to accomplish that, you need, to, you need a growing economy. But, but the proof in the pudding is whether 
average people are succeeding in that. And I think that's still uh, strong and central. I think the thing that is, is different, uh, this came up a little bit in the first panel, which I, which I caught some of, is I think we misunderstood the over-financialization of what was happening in the economy. And um, uh, I think that uh, you saw that part of the economy really expanding. Uh, get, uh, 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 somebody said uh, during the, uh, in, in advance of the uh, financial crisis, if Bill Clinton had been in office, he might have tried to do something about it, <laughs> distinct from his successor. Um, but I think that the, the economy was kind of over-financialized. Uh, and I think that the same thing is true in other advanced economies, I think, as well, particularly in the, in the UK. And I think the need, I think the, the, uh, the um, uh, emphasis now on making sure that financial res re uh, regulation is strong and solid, uh, that people who abuse uh, their positions of power in that s sphere uh, actually don't just get a slap on the wrist, but actually, uh, if they commit crimes, go to jail. Uh, the the, the uh, emphasis on safety and soundness, uh, and the, ef the renewed emphasis right now on the, the, the uh, uh, monopoly power that comes from this from uh, lack of enforcement of antitrust are themes that are more uh, current today in, amongst you know democratic leaders I think than they were back when when we were in office so I think there is a shift uh, and at that time it felt like things were rolling along pretty good and I think maybe uh, the the I think you asked the question about uh, about um, Glass-Steagall. I think that there's a, you know, I think maybe we uh, opened up the valve too much. And I think that there, the question now is whether you can uh, tighten it in a way where, you, where uh, the finance system still providing credit, still uh, supporting uh, main, uh, you know, main Street businesses, uh, but doesn't lead to the abuse that we saw, particularly in the housing financial crisis. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is consistent with what was said this morning, is you don't just make policy and then walk away. Right. you got to deal Probably with true. what comes, right? Um, other questions? Yes, ma'am. No, uh, you can go next, but it's time we have a, a lady in a red dress right here. <laughs> That's perfectly all right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abby Nichols. Uh, my question is, how did you all um, handle trying to balance the political and the policy aspects of the job? First of all, well, I, I can answer that really easy. <laughs> <laughs> John did all of the political. <laughs> he, he did most of the policy. <laughs> And I thank God every day that he was my, my partner in this. I had to beg John to come back to the White House to be deputy chief of staff. And finally, I told him I wasn't going unless he did. And he agreed to come. But John did all the tough stuff when I was there, for sure. Um, you know, I think I was in, I was in uh, there when, when our vice president was running for president, when the first lady was running for Senate. That's kind of a unique circumstance <laughs> to try to buy. <laughs> Uh, policy and <laughs> politics, uh, but I think that uh, generally, I, I, this, this is going to sound Pollyannish, but I think generally our view in the White House was that if we were successful from a policy perspective, that was going to support the politics uh, of the people who, uh, in, in Vice President Gore's case, we wanted to see succeed uh, the president and, and in Hillary's case to get elected to the uh, Senate from New York. So, I mean, there is, um, uh, you, make, uh, you make adjustments, uh, and particularly with our friends, uh, our Democratic friends on Capitol Hill, uh, you pay a little, you know, when, when, you, when you, I think we were, uh, we needed them. There were moments, particularly during my time, when we really needed them badly. <laughs> and, uh, and we were trying, you know, we tried to be, um, uh, responsive to their needs too, and and try to think about the ways in which we were acting together to both again support uh, 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 strong outcomes, which then people could uh, go out and 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 uh, and run on. So good. 
Now, the young man who took the mic, is he there? <laughs> now it's now. Your turn. So I'm curious, did your approach to leadership and working with Congress change after each shutdown? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing you have to remember is when the president announced for the first time that he was going to uh, propose a balanced budget agreement uh, that would balance over a 10-year period, you know, the whole question went from whether we would have a balanced budget to how we would balance it. And we spent a, an enormous amount of time. I mean, we had blow up after blow up after blow up. But I can remember when I came back to be, I, I went home for my youngest son's senior year in high school. And the president let me stay home for like four months or something. And then I got to come back. But when he came back, he said we were going to do this, we were going to do this in the right way. And I can remember going on Tim Russert's show, and there wasn't a soul who believed we could get it done. And this guy, Bill Clinton, was a leader. You know, a Newt Gingrich could walk into his office determined he was going to just fear him. And by the time he left, they was, he was shaking his head, agreeing. <laughs> I mean, he had the ability to bring people together. And at the end of the day, because we did this right, we got 75% of the members of Congress in both the House and the Senate and Democrats and Republicans all voted yes. That's a very different world than we have today. But we had it because we had a leader who had the ability to bring people together to really solve a real issue that we had and do it in the right way. Now the question. Got a guy. Yeah. Uh, got, the, got the mic? There. Uh, I'm just going to talk about, uh, ask question in the balance in the budget. And tell, and, us, and tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Abdullahi. I'm from Somalia. I grew up in southern Minnesota. Uh, in 1995, two years after the taxi giant high, uh, the president uh, office management kind of predicted that two billions, 200 billions deficit. So I just wanted to kind of know the figure was a little bit different. Uh, like, so for the 200 billion and then the balancing, so pretty much, uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think, um, so maybe, Judy, maybe you, you raised this, uh, or Max, Max said it, when we, when, uh, in the run-up to the election, right. in the run-up to the election, it looked like the deficit was going to be like about a hundred billion. I think now, about, that was huge. Yeah, about, that's that right. was huge. Uh, like I remember in because uh, I'm old. Uh, the when <laughs> President Carter sent up a budget uh, towards in '79, I guess maybe right, maybe not in '80, but '79, <clears> uh, that had a forty billion dollar de uh, deficit. Democrats were in control of the Congress, and they sent it back to him. <laughs> and he had to, it's telling him wow. he had to do better. So the, it went from 40 to rising in the, in the kind of mid-80s, coming back down again, and then now exploding. But between that $100 billion, which they thought it was going to be, and coming into office, it had grown to more than $300 billion. That's right. That's right. And um, so I, I think that required some adjustment but real attention on the need to get monetary policy and fiscal policy right. kind of working together. That's right. And, Mac, you know, Mac led that yeah. process. Well, so I don't know why I'm talking. But well, you, no, 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 you've got it. You've got it right. I think some adjustment may be the understatement of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I will always remember uh, being at the governor's mansion uh, in Little Rock uh, before we came to Washington. Uh, President had, Governor Clinton had been elected. The cabinet had been assembled. We had a cabinet meeting the next day. And I called Bob Rubin, who was going to be head of the newly established National Economic Council, which goes back to governing. This was a new, Bruce, you'll remember it, a new arm of the White House uh, to help coordinate economic policy, much like the National Security Policy, uh, National Security Council had done. And I said, Bob, <laughs> We have a problem, just like Houston and NASA. <laughs> the budget is dramatically bigger, larger. And the real fact is, 
President-elect Clinton had to make a pretty snap judgment. I have to do away with my middle class tax cut, which he created a 36, <laughs> but he created a 36 and a 39.6 percent rate. Exactly. Right. And that was, you know, that, those were big adjustments for a new president entering the White House. I do think, Judy, the fact that he had been a governor uh, and had had by state law to balance a budget gave him an understanding of how critical this was. And then that in itself eventually gave confidence to the American people we were on the right track here, and that's how we got the momentum. And as I say again, the rest is history, and that led to the balanced budget. Yeah, inter years interest later. rates over time came down yeah. by over 200 Initial basis points. Policy, 23 million point. new jobs were created. We did have in there, by the way, we did have a gas tax of 4.3 cents. And that was a smart thing to do. It was the right way to raise revenue. Yep, for infrastructure. And it had good benefits to it. So yep. that was a big Ah, problem. the good old days, right? <laughs> yeah. Another question over here. It's coming. Donald Dunn, I uh, work at the Lombardi Cancer Center and, and got to learn from the three of you working at the White House. In, uh, in this time that we live in, what advice do you have for these young people to get involved in politics and governing? Because it doesn't seem like uh, most people would like to do that. Well, I, I think uh, we haven't talked about AmeriCorps National Service, which was you know, a fundamental part of President Clinton's agenda. Uh, I think Erskine has already alluded to it, and John has too. Um, <coughs> It's just a rare privilege to have the opportunity to be in public service and uh, to try to do your very best to make the country better. I mean, that is just really that straightforward. And if Judy were to ask me what is your most rewarding moment. Matt, I mean, I mean, what was your most rewarding moment? Thank you, Judy. Uh, Judy's always been very quick on the uptake and all that time with it. But, but seriously, you know, we can all point to things we're very proud of that we were a part of in terms of policy uh, uh, and, or legislative victories or whatever, but the most rewarding experience is when you meet someone out there in the country and you've enacted a policy, and John and Erskine both have alluded to this, and it has helped them and their families to live a better life and have a better future. That, that is a, a reward and a privilege that is just very hard, if not almost impossible, to replicate in any other line of endeavor. So that, that's the call to public service that you saw that Bill Clinton handshake as a young man when we were both in high school with President John F. Kennedy. That was the call to public service of the Peace Corps and America Corps, AmeriCorps in Clinton's uh, years. Uh, and that's, that's what I would sincerely put forward for your consideration. And, and I'm going to thank you, Mac, and I want to, we're going to use this as our last question, and I, before the other, the, you, you gentlemen respond, um, just would do a plug for our Baker Center on Leadership uh, and Governance, on Governance and Leadership, either order, um, and th th think about the, the message, again, to people today, to, to both serve and lead. Well, I'll, I'll go next. I mean, I, I watched the film here uh, uh, of President Clinton's experience at Georgetown. I'm a little younger than he is, but I was, but not by much. And I got involved with politics because I didn't think the country was going in the right direction. Um, you know, particularly in the context of, of trying to end the Vietnam War, and w did my first campaign in 1968. Uh, I was went to, I did go to Georgetown Law School. <laughs> <laughs> and I first met him uh, in, a, in essentially what was the most important anti-war uh, Senate campaign in 1970 when he was at Yale Law School. I was, I was still in school and dropped out to work in a campaign in Connecticut. And uh, I would say that the reason I did all that uh, was because I wanted to shape the, help shape the future. And uh, I come, you know, I can, I can outdo these guys on coming from humble origin. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, my grandparents are all immigrants. My, uh, and 
my father worked for a factory all his life, but the country's given me great opportunity. But I think that if you, if you either really like, in which case maybe um, uh, I have some other advice for you. If you really like the direction of the country right now, <laughs> keep at it. Or if you really don't like the direction of the country right now, the vehicle for changing that is politics. It's, it's public service. It's being engaged. It's helping in your communities. But overall, the direction of the country is set uh, in our democracy through uh, engagement in politics. And I'm glad I did it back then. Uh, and I found it rewarding my whole life. And I, I conclude where, where Mac was. When you meet someone whose life's just been made a little bit better, it's, you know, it's, it's better than all the money in the world. Politics gave me this guy as <laughs> good a friend as I've ever had. Uh, look, uh, in the Old South, uh, in the wintertime, every family would go out and chop a few logs to keep their family warm over the winter. But on the way home, you'd throw a few logs on the community woodpile. And my dad always told me that all of us have a responsibility to add to that community woodpile. And he told me the truth. He said, it doesn't matter if you're to the right of Jesse Helms or to the left of Gore Vidal. <laughs> all of us in our own way can work to make this world a better place. My experience in adding to the woodpile has been the greatest experience of my life. I got far more than I gave. And I wouldn't trade the opportunity that President Clinton gave me to serve our country for any other opportunity you could name. Well, I'm inspired. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to thank all of you, not only for being here today, but for the opportunity to serve with all of you. Thank you. Um, and to say you can't do, but that have better models for why it is you ought to go into politics and public service. So thank you all very much. You did great. You did great. That's great. Yeah, you did great. I want to thank Judy and all the panelists, not just for this one, but throughout the day, many of whom have hung in there and are still here. Um, you know, as we said at the outset today, that this was really a day to kind of explore Bill Clinton's vision. And I, uh, I sat back as I listened to all the panels. And uh, it's a testament, I think, uh, to his leadership and to uh, probably some good training from his communications chiefs. Because in every panel, I heard the same four words over and over. Opportunity, responsibility, community, and service. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward, and I hope you all will join us as we hear the president this afternoon talk about what it means for him and all of us moving forward. I invite you all to join us. Uh, for those of you that don't have a ticket yet, and if you got a Georgetown ID, please uh, feel free to get in the line that's already started to form outside of Gaston Hall. Um, and uh, for those of you that are unable to join it in person, uh, it will be streamed online. And uh, we'll also have an overflow room over in the Healy Family Student Center for those of you that kind of watch it as part of a community. So again, thank you to everyone for being here with us today, uh, and uh, look forward to you joining us in one way or another uh, later this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>